Hi, I'm Matthias Beck, one of the authors of Computing the Continuous Discreetly. And in this video, we will start with the main players of Chapter 2, introducing some families of polytopes and the lattice point enumerators that we'll be talking about for the rest of the book and the rest of this video series. Okay, um, to start talking about polytopes, maybe we should start talking about convexity. What does it mean for an object to be convex? Um, so it means if I, if I give, I pick two points, let's say x and y in this object, then I want to demand that the line segment connecting x and y is also in the object. One way to describe this line segment is, is through a convex combination. So this is the set of all points, uh, lambda x plus mu y, where uh, lambda and mu are real parameters bigger than zero that um, add up to one. So if you've never seen this, I invite you to realize that this is precisely a description of a line segment going from x to y. And this motivates one definition of a polytope, namely as the convex hull of a finite set of points. So the convex hull is the smallest convex set containing these points. And you can translate this into the, the bottom line on this on the slide, which is, if you think about it, uh, a, a generalization of the way I'm writing my uh, line from x to y up above. For example, in this case, I have a trapezoid um, and I might write this as the convex hull of, of these four points. But I might add some points, um, and this will still be a convex hull description. So this means in general a convex hull description is not unique, but there is a minimal one, namely in this case using these for points, and this is called a vertex description of the polytope. While we're talking about definitions, sometimes we will use the phrase lattice polytope or integral polytope. And what this means is I can choose this convex hull description using points with integer coordinates. So these two um, are the same. Um, I will also sometimes talk about a rational polytope. Um, and this means my vertices have rational entries. A polytope is inherently a linear object. It is described by linear constraints. And this gives a second description of a polytope, namely as the intersection of a finite number of half spaces. So we should define these terms. So a hyperplane, so here I'm in some d-dimensional space, is, of, is a set of the form that you see on this slide. Uh, namely, I have one linear equation. And this hyperplane gives rise to a half space. By changing this um, equation to an inequality, either less than equal or big unequal. And so if I have now an intersection of half spaces, we will call this a polyhedron. And if this polyhedron is bounded 
I claim we will get again a polytope. So in this case, you might have um, half spaces of the sort where I'm uh, I'm on this side of of this line, um, and then another line and a half space. Um, if I could just draw straight lines here, here's another half space and here's a fourth one. And lo and behold, the intersection of these four half spaces gives me the same trapezoid. It is a non-trivial theorem that these two constructions yield the same kinds of object. So what I'm trying to say is that the set of all objects that can be described as the convex hull of a finite number of points and a set of all objects that are intersections of a finite number of half spaces and this intersection is bounded, those two sets are precisely equal. This is sometimes called the fundamental theorem of polytopes and it would take me um, a whole lecture uh, to prove this theorem. In fact, in the book, we have a proof in the appendix. Hyperplanes are also used to define the notion of a face of a polytope. So for this, I need to uh, tell you what a supporting hyperplane is. So this now um, refers to a given polytope P, such as my trapezoid here. So a supporting hyperplane is one where, where P is entirely con contained in one of the half spaces, uh, either um, the one given by one uh, inequality or the other. So that means that P is contained in, in one of the half spaces defined by this hyperplane. So let me give you an example. So let's say I, I use this hyperplane, then uh, and P is, is contained in, in the half space to the left of this, of this line. And so this is one supporting hyperplane, but there's uh, many, many supporting hyperplanes. I could move that, for example, to the right, um, or I could slant my a hyperplane. At any rate, um, this allows me to define a, a face um, as the intersection of P with such a supporting hyperplane. So for example, my supporting hyperplane that you see in this picture for this trapezoid defines this point here as a face. Let me give you another example. So here is another supporting hyperplane um, because the trapezoid is um, entirely contained in this half space underneath and the intersection of the hyperplane with the, uh, with the trapezoid is this line segment over here. So this is another face. We will also think of the whole polytope, in this case the trapezoid, as a face. You can think of this as sort of the intersection of the polytope with a degenerate hyperplane. It gives you the whole space. Um, and I will most often also think of the empty set as a face. That is, I could take a supporting hyperplane that does not touch my polytope and then the intersection will be empty. What you see here, um, so this face down here is um, a face of dimension zero and this is by definition we will call this a vertex of P. Um, Here's a face of dimension one, which we call an edge. In general, in, in, in general dimension, there's also a special name for the faces of co-dimension one. So if you have a polytope that's, that has dimension D, a face of dimension D minus one will be called a facet. And so in this case, my edge, because my polytope has dimension 
two, my edge is at the same time a facet. I invite you to look at the various examples of polytopes in this chapter and in later chapters and keep this sort of dual definition of a polytope in mind. It's a vertex description or a hyperplane description and realize the face structure. So realize where the faces are of the polytope and how we can certify them by picking a supporting hyperplane that gives the correct face. There's much more to be said about the theory of, of polytopes and polyhedra. Um, I recommend two of my favorite books. There's a book by uh, Branko Grunbaum that was written in the 60s and it was updated about 10 years ago. That's a classic. And there's a book by uh, Günther Ziegler that was written in the 90s. And these are two of the books where you can find a lot of background and a lot of beautiful theory and computations and pictures of uh, convex polyhedra. <laughs>
and deduce the counting function from it. And there's two important tools that I would like you to have at your disposal. Um, so maybe let's start with the first uh, direction from uh, the counting function L of t to the Erhard series, so the generating function. So very soon we will realize that in at least in, in under mild conditions this counting function will be a polynomial and so a, a really good tool is the following um, definition. So this is the generating function for a monomial. So this is a fixed power d um, and I'm taking the generating function of the, of the monomials j to the d um, and it involves something called Eulerian numbers or these polynomials up on the numerator of these rational functions are called the Eulerian polynomials and you, you will read about them in, in this chapter and the point, the point of this is once you, you can deal with monomials, it's a, it's a short step to deal with um, generating functions of a, of a polynomial because um, a polynomial is just a weighted sum of monomials and so in principle at least I can now from from this generating function involving Eulerian numbers I can build the generating function for any polynomial. And for the reverse direction uh, computing the counting function L of t from the generating function I claim the following identity is very helpful. This is called the binomial series because it has binomial coefficients as, as coefficients of this, this power series. So what we will see that Erhard series, so these, these generating functions um, on the bottom right, they will always be rational functions with um, this denominator over here or domino of this form so we have a 1 minus z to some power and so again so once you realize you can expand this rational function 1 over 1 minus z to the d plus 1 we can actually um, expand any polynomial I guess this is a polynomial in Z over um, a denominator of this of this form. We can expand any rational function with a general polynomial um, as the numerator because this will be then a linear combination on the right hand side of the generating function of some binomial coefficients. We will see this much in action in uh, chapter 3 but I mean I invite you to look look at this already and and maybe uh, guess a little bit of foresight as you're working through the examples in chapter 2.